Welcome to EV Obsession, September 1st. I'm your host, Joe Boris, here as ever with my good friend and colleague, the CEO of Clean Technica, Zachary Shahan. Zach, I don't even know where to start, man. So much has happened in the last 12 hours. I literally don't know where to start. It's Please. funny because I think last episode was like, it was digging for some stories. And then this one was like, oh my God, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Yeah. And then Tesla unveiled its... Or didn't really, I don't know what's going on with how this worked, but the big story is the Tesla Model 3 Highland is finally out. The refreshed version of the Tesla Model 3, that's the big news that people have been waiting for. It's a sort of strange, because it wasn't announced on the Tesla blog, and it wasn't no, it just on kind the US of website. No, it just leaked out all at the same time. To you, to big YouTube channels, which we are, of course. We oh, we're the, the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> We're just huge. The email. We also pissed off Elon a couple of times. So that might have been. Um... He was tweeting us a little bit, but like, I don't know. At this point, with like the weird oh, racist pseudo trans no, no, no. turf. Let's not thing. go. Let's not yeah. go there. Let's focus on the EVs. But yeah, I mean, he used to tweet our stuff like a few times a week. And then um, he got into interested in other topics beyond. Other EVs. topics beyond clean tech. Exactly right. But So like, the Model 3 is interesting, right? Because the rollout, as you said, was unique. It wasn't announced. It wasn't like a big announcement it wasn't some huge you know investor call it just kind of came upon us right now and and i have questions about this because i don't really understand it i know that we were supposed to get a lower price model three and this is supposed to be significantly less expensive to manufacture but is the price actually lower i mean this is just about refreshing the model three a lot they are bringing down costs a bit they've They've changed 50% of the parts and that's more efficient, but it's, um, I mean, it's not the low cost Tesla that's coming. That's not what you're talking about, right? No, it's not like the model C or the whatever they were going to call that thing. Whatever, model yeah. B or two. Yeah, exactly. No, it's not that, but I mean, no, the idea I mean, was a $35,000 model three at some point in history, right? Well, it's already below 40,000 before this, but I think it's, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, there's a lot here. <laughs> there's a lot. There's to a lot to unpack. There's a so lot. To unpack. There's not a lot that's updated, which is what's funny. But that, but there's a lot to unpack because, I mean, first of all, I think the Model Three has sort of struggled since the Model Y took over, and it didn't yes. drop, but it plateaued, and it went from being king of the hill to hardly mentioned. And the Model Y has vastly you know, surpassed it and taken yeah. over EV sales. But that has Google. happened everywhere. That's an industry yes. trend. I don't yeah. think that's specific to Tesla. If you look at oh. Ford and you look at Ford's vehicle lineup right now, they have exactly one car. What yeah, do I mean by their, that? Yeah. Yeah. They have no sedans. There's no Taurus. There's no Fusion. There's no Escort or Contour or any other Ford that you might have remembered from the last 40 years. None of them exist. The only thing that is not a truck or SUV from Ford is the Mustang. And that shares so many parts with the Ranger, it might as well be a Ranger. And even the Mustang, there's a crossover version now. <laughs> and even the Mustang, there's a crossover version. The market has gone away from the traditional sedans and coupes and hatchbacks that we all grew up with or, or you know, everybody under 50 but over 20 grew up with, right? So real people, We're real talking people, real people, people, people who buy cars. Yeah. Not, not kids. They have no money. They never will. The way inflation is going and global warming. Back in my day. Yeah. I you're under 25. Kids. You're never going to own a car. Forget it. <laughs> Just, this is a happy ray of sunshine. No soup for you. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> you'll pick one up in the climate wars when you slaughter a Gen Xer and take his keys. No soup for new you. No car for you. <laughs> this has really gone Bitcoin off the rails quickly. I like it. Uh, but I, again, I, I this is really interesting because there is a lot to cover here. So it's got a revised suspension geometry, which arguably is for a better ride, but potentially is more about reducing costs of manufacturing. It now has acoustic glass, which is something that a lot of people, myself included, complained about. I always thought the Model 3s were very loud, very harsh sounding. This is the number one biggest problem with the Model 3. I have one for four years and I've talked to people who who have and who don't have and across the board if you've spent time in one you know the biggest problem with the model three is as loud as f it is on the interstate on highway on fast roads even on slow roads that aren't just aren't quiet 
so it's the number one problem they had to had to fix in my opinion like yeah and i think they did a good job with that they also upped the number of speakers from 14 to 17 up front which i think also speaks to the fact that they understand they needed to do some noise cancellation right so now you have more sound a little bit and and the audio files always love the tesla sound that's something that I recently became aware of in the last like six months that Tesla people are like really excited about their audio systems. You know, so that's interesting. We talked about that once and I think we did. And I've been like you went on, into it. You went in looking into it. I did. Yeah. I was like, there's no way. Like, no, no, no. Bowers Wilkinson, well, that's the way to go. This is well, you said one fun. thing that I would like you to talk about a little bit more. So, you know, in the announcements, they highlight all the stuff that's better and improved and upgraded. Um, I'm curious your take. You know, they're not going to say we did this to save money while still charging this you know we did this to improve our margins so i'm curious which of these announcements do you look at and you say oh that was to cut costs every single one of them <laughs> everyone <laughs> no no no. I, I really mean that i really mean that the, the the only one that i would say is not to cut costs is the acoustic glass and, and well there's and, also a screen a touch screen in the back seat now that's so, that's not going to cost. Oh, I disagree. This is this really? is where this is where like the the weirdness of manufacturing comes into play, right? If you look at like even the most basic least expensive car you can buy on the road right now, uh the Mitsubishi Mirage, right? Which is an ICE car. It used to be $14,000, then it was like right now the the latest model is just over 20,000 for the ultra base model but it has a touchscreen navigation, things like that. And you go over to Mazda, you look at their basic threes and CX thirties and they all have touchscreens. It's not because they have just decided, Hey man, we're not going after that low end of the market. It's because that touchscreen has become less expensive to pro to buy and install in a vehicle and program than the old school buttons and switches and knobs. And yeah, those- but it's, it's still more expensive than an illegal footrest. Like I, not, there I was nothing you. there. There's no, nothing I hear there. You, but unless it's gonna, it's an economy I mean, yeah. of scale thing. It's an economy I mean, I think of scale it's, thing. It's bringing I think they all just that in. Decided it was required. I think it was required, and I think, in in addition to being required, I think that there is a weird scenario that happens when you start buying things in large numbers, where it is less expensive to order a thousand of something than a hundred of something. Well, as I was trying to think about this, as you're talking, I was like, well, the one thing it could be useful for in terms of costs down the road is, you know, the touch screen is wearing out over time. Like it's not, it's not lasting forever. It's like, a, you know, like a computer. It's just, it gets worse. The lag gets worse. Mm-hmm. And eventually it just doesn't work even. Uh, we had a 2015 Model S in our Tesla shuttle fleet. Oh, it's right behind me in the picture. There you go. This is still uh, with one of the co-founders of Tesla shuttle. His wife drives it now. So it's eight years old. And the screen has a lot of issues with lag, needing rebooted. Even after you reboot it, it, does, it needs rebooted again. So the screen has be- the touch screen has become an issue. So if you have a much smaller, cheaper one that's um, the kids can watch Netflix and Disney Plus and YouTube on in the back seat, I imagine that would help the longevity of the bigger one and and would or spreads uh, out the load because again spreads you know, out the load. Well, it's true. And Sandy Sandy Monroe will talk about this all the time when he talks about the manufacturing genius of Tesla and what really got it through my head of what they were doing was the conversation about the super bottle. The super bottle is like a, a component within the Tesla heating system that did you like that? I was drinking from my coffee cup. It was like my from super the super bottle. bottle. I did. Mm-hmm. I did. I thought that was good at the totally, same totally time. Unplanned, but we're in re- sync. Show. I, we are we're in sync. sync. It's and that's why show. I keep interrupting you. I know it's, it's okay. I'll edit it out. So it seems like you're a decent human. The super bottle itself removes a lot of failure points. So when you when it fails and you have to replace it, you're replacing the equivalent of like seven parts from another manufacturer. But by removing those failure points, you have to replace far fewer of them. And that reduces warranty costs and labor costs and things like that. By finding a low cost alternative to that touchscreen and moving it to the back, if you're able to reduce the number of failures and the number of warranty claims against that front passenger touchscreen that is bigger, requires the dashboard to come out to replace and maintain, you could conceivably say, this is a cost-cutting measure. 
because by putting this in the back, we have to replace 15% fewer front ones and that costs us less money. Yeah, it's definitely possible. I still think it's just a case of like, they were like, oh yeah, kids need a screen in the back, whatever, you know? And uh, as a father of two young girls who I would like to say always get along, but do not. Do not. Uh, there's, it's also useful in a case of, oh, we're going to be stopped here for a while and you have to sit in the car instead of like you both can play this game together. Okay, you can play on this screen, you can play on this screen, or you can watch something on this screen, you can watch something on this screen. It's, oh, you can watch like, two different things on it. That's smart. I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> now, now that, <laughs> well, at, at, <laughs> now, here, here now you that, go, Tesla. Here's your yes. uh, consulting fee. We need yeah, to be we'll able to, to watch two different we'll shows figure that out. <laughs> through two different sets of Bluetooth headphones. Yeah, you probably can't watch two different things. It's probably, but anyway, but still, uh, I still think it's just basically like kids need a screen in the back and they're like, okay, we'll give you a screen in the back for the kids. Yeah. The other thing, like, I don't know, one of the other big improvements for me is that you can, you can split the uh, air conditioner between the driver and the front passenger. Like, Oh, I don't think that's ridiculous. That's huge. No, that's what I'm saying. It's huge, but it's ridiculous that this wasn't the default it's ridiculous that that wasn't <laughs> like, already there like this has been one of the most ridiculous yeah. things with the car is like if i want it blowing hard and my wife wants it not blowing hard on her which is always the case i always want more air she always wants less air zach it's always like, wants it hard you know she you should be able to control the air vents separately well here's the thing that i always try to explain to people a tesla model three is and I'm and just kind of go with me on this. It's not a luxury car. It's never been a luxury car. It might have a luxury price tag. It might have luxury performance, but it's not a luxury car in the conventional sense. It is just now getting features that have been pretty basic for well over a decade. But that's not even a luxury feature. This is a basic, basic feature. In, but they in, did something yeah, with the air fair. vent. They, I don't. I still don't know. I mean, they did, they did, they made the air vent. The they special figured it out. Way, and they did what they wanted. And you can adjust where the fan aims, but it just made no sense that you would not have different fan levels on different sides of the car. Like anyone who's had a wife or a husband or a partner who's not like exactly like them knows that people want different right. fan levels, of course. But Elon's had a few wives, so I don't know. But you know maybe that's part of the problem that's that's what i'm saying like maybe yeah. he's just like we do it my way or the highway and uh so the oh highway, the highway it is but yeah wait, I mean, this is why i don't have a dodge dart this is so good so i'm we we test drove a dodge dart uh when they first came out the srt version i want to say 2014 2015 and manual transmission and i loved the car i was in love with it i wanted to buy it i thought it was great and my wife and I was a manual transit and I had my hand on the shifter and right in front of the shifter was the radio. And I thought that was great because I could adjust the volume and switch songs and everything without taking my hands off the shifter. And my wife leaned over to like, just like, oh, I hate this song. I'm going to change it. And she went to change it. And from the shifter, I was able to like smack her hand away from the radio. And she looked right at me and says, you're not allowed to have this car anymore. And I was That's like, oh. <gasps> no yeah. and she was serious she was like negative if that car shows up you're gonna live in it and i was like oh no <laughs> well on the, on the topic you were talking about like it's they've never even really called them luxury cars they always call them uh, premium cars that's what they always tesla like didn't use the word luxury they used the word premium because they were premium for the tech and the performance they were not luxury because they don't have massage seats and fancy stuff like that and they were minimalist because one it saved money and two elon's minimalist um it's good that they're adding some features they're adding some stuff they're cutting costs in other ways but i don't see it the the overarching thing that i almost said right at the beginning i don't see it as a huge dramatic up upgrade or refresh and i think that's been the question how big is this refresh going to be and now we're seeing it's notable but it's not huge. So I think it's going to drive sales for the Model 3 for a bit. 
sort of ease the the pain of the Model Y taking over its crown. And then, I mean, the Model Y should get the refresh too, right? So, and then it's like a question, like what happens with the Model 3 then? Like, is it, I don't know. So then maybe they lower costs. Maybe then they bring costs down Price down, because they're able cost. to, and it's not brand new and it's not hot new free refresh and the Model Y is getting. So then maybe you get a cheaper Model 3, like you were talking about. I don't know. You know, I look at this and I go, yeah, there's definitely a difference. This is definitely new. But I, I take this almost like when Porsche comes out with like a new variant of the 911, like, you know, from the 9971 to the 9972, a lot of people that are Porsche people can tell the difference. Maybe there's a difference under the hood that the, uh, the real experts know about. But by and large, the people that you drive by on the street who go, oh, look, honey, a Porsche, they don't really see a difference. And I think this is going to be something similar. I think you and I might notice the difference. You more than me. Oh, um, dude, you can't even tell the difference between a Model X and a Model Y. You're not going to see it. No, I'm not going to see it. But I, <laughs> no, I also most think people are not most people cannot tell the difference between the models, the Tesla models. Correct. They're not going to see the difference between the new Model 3 and the old Model 3. But here's the question. If you can't tell the difference between a new Model 3 and an old Model 3, there is no incentive to run out and grab it. So what this is, is something to appease the people who have had a model three who have leased one, maybe they've leased two and they need a reason to lease a third one or people who have been on the fence saying, man, I want a model three, but I'm, I've heard a lot about Highland. I want to see what that is before I pull the trigger. But I don't think that anyone who was on the waiting list for the old model three or the, the original model three is going to be upset if they get that car and not the Highland. Yeah, well, actually, my friend, my other, the other main co-founder of Tesla Shuttle, Yatsek, who writes for Clean Technica, just published a story of his today. He just received a Model 3 yesterday, new Model 3. Uh, so he's got a brand new Model 3. Of course, it's this original type. We told him, we we're like, dude, you should just wait for the Highland because, you know, it's about to come out. And he couldn't wait because of, you know, practical reasons. Yeah, he had his reasons, sure. He had turned in his car and he needed another one. And uh, looking at it, I was like, you know, I don't think Yasek's going to care. And actually, because it doesn't have freaking, what do you call it? Um, freaking stocks for the turn signals and the... Oh, like, yeah, he's it has the happy. buttons. It has the, the It has the buttons. buttons. It doesn't have the, oh, the stocks. Man, I hate And I guarantee you, like, I'm like, well, Yasek will be happy he doesn't have that that version. <laughs> yeah. So on the one hand, they've improved stuff that I think a lot of people complained about. Noise. The air vents not being adjustable, adjustable by, yeah. by who, you know, and, you know, improved with the screen in the back. But they've taken away the stocks, which I think is going to, I mean, I, I know they're set on it, but it's just, I don't think, I, don't, I haven't yet to meet someone who really is happy about that. Of course, there's a few Tesla guys on Twitter who are like, hey, now that I've got it, I like it more. I was like, eh, you're just, you it's, I really think it's more like Tesla. It's more like, I'm sorry, not Tesla. It's more like Apple and Android. Like the iPhone does things differently than an Android, right? Like you swipe differently to do different things and like you press different buttons to do different stuff. And once you've gotten used to your phone, switching to the other one is a nightmare. And like, I have both, right? Because we yeah, but like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people are used to the stocks. <laughs> yeah, and they're going to, um, you know, they're going to be willing to change because uh, they want to drive a Tesla, and the Tesla brand means something, or they won't. <laughs> I don't know. That's the question. I mean, I guarantee I'm. I can hear people now going in for a test drive and be like, "But where's this thing to change to drive?" Oh, they use buttons. It's like, ah, I think I'll go with the other car. I, like, I don't you. really care personally. I would, I don't care stock or not. I'll, I would adjust. I'm fine. I know most people are not like that, and they're like, I want my stock, you know. But uh, but yeah, I mean, but do there's... you really think that there's? I mean, I know there's outliers. There's always going to be outliers, but I think the majority of people who are buying a Tesla in 2023, they're buying. To me, I think they're buying into the brand, and they're buying oh, into true. the experience, right? And I think if you're the kind okay. of person who's yeah. going to get turned off by the stock, you've already been turned off by the, um, let's say, yeah. public image problem that Tesla is facing. 
No, yeah, I think it's true. I think, like you said earlier, I think a lot of the buyers are expected to be, I mean, I expect a lot of the buyers to be Model 3 owners who trade in their cars for the new Model 3. Yeah. And they will see it as important to get the refresh model because they know everything that's happening with Tesla. Like, they're not like people on the street who are like, what's the difference between them? You know, they, they're like, look at all these differences. Look yeah. at all the, you know. So I think they're, I think that's a, a big target. I think there's just a case of they had to fix stuff that well, to keep it competitive because you can't yeah, get away with when you're the first kid on the block and you have the only electric option, you can get away with some things because you're delivering a product that no one else has. You have an electric sedan. But now that you've got competitors coming from BMW, from Mercedes Benz, you've got other EVs coming to market from you know Nissan and Japan and Korea. You have to at least be able to go feature to feature. When someone gets into a Hyundai Ionic 6, which I, you know, is a tremendous car, and it's quieter, nicer, the textures are better, the 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 plastics are softer, and they get out of that car and they go, man, this Hyundai is just as nice, if not nicer, than the Tesla. That's a problem if you're trying to market yourself as a premium brand. So I, I'm glad that they did it. The other thing that's interesting here is, and I want to touch on this idea of change for the repeat customers. I have a Volvo XC90. I, this is my third Volvo XC90 because they came out in 2015 and we got one in 2016, 17, 18, 19, uh, 19, 20, 21. We got this one in 21. It's really going to be hard to justify getting a fourth one of these things. And like, yeah even though I love the car and, and I love the brand and I love what they're doing, like I really don't want to buy a fourth one of these or at least yeah, a fourth but, one of these things. Like give me something new. But think about this with the history of Tesla too. I mean, they've all of their sales were conquest sales for a year for the past several years. I mean, like, sure. of course there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of people who have bought their second, third, fourth Tesla, but there weren't that many Teslas on the road. Like as like their sales, well, there's more to, Teslas than Volvos, which is wild. Yeah, yeah, but there have to be they have to be new buyers for 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 years, and now they're getting to the point where they have to re get repeat buyers. I mean, they need not just. That's a good I mean, point. they've always had a high percentage of repeat buyers, but it's just from a from a very low base. Now they've got a higher base, a more mass market base, and they need to find a way to get yeah. those people and to, re more to buy another one, and they need to sustain high sales levels they need to grow 50 percent, you know every year that's a it's a big it's a big target when you're talking five, half a million model three sales a year and you need to find a way to repeat that and grow that you need to find a way to get current owners to trade in their their model three right. and get new ones and and so i think that's a big part of it you need to find reasons for people to buy a new one and not just buy a used one that's off lease yes yeah, the competition. So the Hyundai Ioniq 6, this is a hot vehicle. People Gorgeous love car. this. Everybody loves it. I know. We can talk about it. I mean, what does it have this? Can we not? Because I got 3? the five and I should have waited and I'm bitter. I love the five. Look, <laughs> I, love I love the, the five. five. And I see every time I see it, I'm like, I love it more. I love the five, Ioniq 5. Yeah. But I mean, we could talk about the five, but the six is like more of that, the Model 3 style, sporty. I agree. It's more sedan. Uh, style and i mean you, you tell talk in a minute like what's how it competes because it actually competes with the model 3 and there's other vehicles that do now so tesla is really in a pickle because they actually have competitors for once and even like two years ago i saw a guy with an audi e-tron at the park and i was like talking to him and and he was like yeah i did a test drive with the tesla i thought about it but it just was so loud so i got the the e-tron much quieter I'm like, yep. It's yeah. <laughs> like, yep. That is that is one very valid reason. Yeah. A lot of Tesla fans would be like, but the range, but the efficiency, but this, mm -hmm. but that. And it's like, yeah, but people want to drive in a quiet car. And I mean, there's other reasons to buy cars mm -hmm. than reasons to buy the Model 3. So, I mean, talk about what the Ioniq 6 has that makes the Model 3 say, hey, I need to pick up the pace again. Man, I would just say that it, it, feels like a premium luxury car you know it, it's when you get in it like i'll say in the back right because like my primary experience with the tesla model 3 is not from ownership it's from riding in the back of them as ubers and lifts right and they feel very cheap to sit in the seats are not that nice the leather is not that nice 
The plastic is very hard and thermosy, an igloo cooler kind of the level black of glossy plastic. plastic. Everybody's it's hated so it for bad. years. Yeah, Elon Musk like it. On- you close the window, you know, you close the door, and it just feels like. You know, like when you, it feels like you're getting out of a 1988 Oldsmobile Cutlass and someone just slammed the door. It's not a quality experience. It's not bad, but it's not good either. When you get into the Hyundai, it is noticeably quieter. The plastics are noticeably softer. You can adjust the AC to yourself. When you're going down the road, you don't hear the tires. You don't hear the wind. It is truly a quiet experience. And I will say this, that, and this is specific to the Ionic 5, because I, I, I haven't driven the 6 um, I, I, for any kind of appreciable amount of time or, or on any kind of roads, just kind of around a little parking lot. Oh, so experience. you have driven one a bit. That's nice. It's a little, I mean, you know, just you know how bit. those things are. You yeah. go around yeah, yeah. and they're like, oh, you turn left here. And, you know, it's the auto show kind of deal. And it's, it's fine. You get, to, you get to feel whether or not you're comfortable, but it's not the same as driving the car. The 5, I have some real experience with. And the five feels minimalistic. It has a very similar sort of clean styling. It's not brutally minimalistic in the way that I think the model three is. Um, it's not a brutalist kind of styling. It's, it, it's kind of, to me, the difference between like star star Trek and Battlestar Galactica, like star Trek is like optimistic. We figured it out. The future is light and clean and airy. And like, it's not like these hard black angles and like weird red lights and everything, which is a different vision of the future. And, and they both are minimalistic. They both are uncluttered, but one feels kind of fun and playful. And the other one is just like stark. There's so much, so many things coming to mind. Well, there's like even more constantly. Tesla news. The model S and the model X got their prices dropped, which yeah. to your point about Tesla having to find more buyers, this is a demand lever. You're pulling the levers. You're trying to goose demand and get more sales by reducing the price. The Model X is now inexpensive enough in terms of MSRP that it qualifies for the full $7,500 tax credit. And that one hurts me because the Model X, in my opinion, is a direct competitor to the XC90 T8, the hybrid. It's a plug-in hybrid. To most people, that's going to operate as an electric vehicle around town. So wait, reading between the lines, you're going to not get a new XC90 and you're going to get a Model X, no, right? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> but here's why. Not because I'm not into it. Oh, yeah. You we went. Know. No, no, no. We went and looked at it. We had this conversation. We were in Chicago. We were like, you know what? This is dumb. I'm I don't want to buy. Joe Boris considered getting a Tesla. Well, here, this is the wife, because the wife drives okay. the XC90. Okay. I, I got to hear, hear the full story here. I want to hear all of it. <laughs> yeah, this is real simple. We were we were looking at, you know, we, we got the thing in the mail that like, oh, you know, our, our lease is going to be up in like three or four months, right? So we have to decide what to do with this thing. So the question is, do we get a fourth XC90 or do we just buy this one? I think we're leaning towards buying this one, but... We're looking at the Model X, right? It's the only vehicle with anything remotely close to a comparable safety rating. And you can say, oh, they're all top safety pick pluses, but like, I guarantee you my XC90 would shred right through a Subaru and like slaughter everyone inside of it. And it might feel like I ran over a trash can. There's, there's yeah, no They comparison. need more differentiation at the top levels. They need more differentiation. So I, I go to the, you know, I, so we look at the Model X and first words out of her mouth are, Can I get one without these stupid doors? That was the extent of that interest. She was really into it. She was really excited. She was sitting in the driver's seat and then, oh, let's take it for a drive. I'm going to go sit in the back and the thing, the door opens up and she's like, can I get one without that? No, they're all like that. She got up out of the car and walked out. She was like, that's it. That's ridiculous. I'm not going to have that. I like the fucking doors, but this is, you know, our history. I'm a (laughs) I'm a fan of most things Tesla's done up to now, but I think. But if you have to park that thing in a garage with children, forget it. Well, it's, you know, it's, they're actuating, but yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I'm actuating right now. I think this is big and I really, I think it's bigger than a lot of people. How Do you think Model X sales are going to take off because of this? No, no. No, I want the supercharging, opening up the supercharging, because oh, for a I long didn't time. I have that on the list. That's another huge, well, huge, huge news story. Well, just 
for a long time, people have bought Teslas because they're by far the best EVs available in the U.S. And you have supercharging, which, make, which makes long-range travel super easy, super yes. reliable. It's the only truly very reliable and easy fast charging network. So Tesla opening up supercharging to everyone else, pretty much. On the one hand, you could see them making bank on that. Like they will have a monopoly if Electrify America and EVgo fall apart. And which even is if it's like grow, happening as we speak, which, which is quite possible. So if they get a monopoly, I mean, just continue to grow that monopoly for five to 10 years and then be like, well, what's wrong? Like we, we didn't do it. Like they, they died, you know, and, uh, and then they can, they can charge more, even if they charge a little bit more when 50% of the country is driving electric and everyone's using the supercharger network, that's money. On the other hand, this is taking away Tesla's number one competitive advantage, in my opinion. Like this is the number one competitive advantage that makes people say, well, I would like this EV maybe, but I got to get a Tesla because I need superchargers. And there's a lot of people in that boat, I think. I think it's more than Tesla recognizes, more than a lot of people recognize. Our surveys year after year indicated that with, with EV owners. But aside from just the surveys, talk to anyone and just common sense, like look at what, you know, you want a car that's going to be able to road trip wherever you want and you have to have a supercharger there. So with that in mind, man, Tesla's got a lot more competition because all of a sudden all these other EVs are on the table and they weren't before. It's so, such a weird choice. And I, to me, it feels like an ego driven choice because from a business perspective, Tesla is, and I've said this before, to their credit, Tesla took ownership of the fact that they had to deliver on the customer experience and control the customer experience in order to properly deliver a vehicle that would work and, and deliver on the promises that they made. And they built out the supercharger network where every other OEM kind of left that to someone else. They made charging the car someone else's problem even volkswagen which is ostensibly owned or began electrify america because they were forced to they kind of just made that a separate department and that'll handle itself they did not take ownership of the experience and put the money and effort and investment and effectively risk into putting that in there now look at this from the point of view of a tesla owner up until now you've had the luxury of being able to take your Tesla to a supercharger and for the most part, be able to get in and out very quickly, find a, an open spot. And maybe it's not the first choice, but you know, you go a couple blocks or a couple miles and you find another one, especially in urban areas. Now there's a real possibility that you're going to pull up to a supercharger station because you know it's there and it's a target or whatever. And instead of one or two Teslas being there, it's going to be one or two Teslas, an Ionic, a Kia EV6, a Ford Lightning or two, maybe a Chevy Blazer. And now are you going to be able to charge your Tesla at the supercharger? You're going to have to sit there and wait until the Hyundai guy is done. I think well, there's a lot of Tesla I dudes that are going to take that as an ego hit. I think I have a few a few things. So one, based on current trends, like um, you know, Tesla's growing the network enough that you should never have to wait for a supercharger, and that's one of the reasons why everybody loves it. I never, I waited once in in four plus years of ownership, and it was like a five minute wait. And it's, but anyway, is and I've used it like hundreds of times superchargers. So I don't think there's much of it issue with that but at the same time if you pull up and those those other evs are charging all of a sudden it's not just like oh i just live in tesla tesla world mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like oh yeah let me check out that EV. ev it's like oh that has this oh that's interesting oh maybe i will get one of those you know and i think it's just it's marketing for the other brands like of course it's, it's marketing, marketing for tesla brands. as well but it's marketing for the other brands as well and and on the ego side like i think elon just assumes our EVs are that much better. Like our EVs are so much better that it doesn't matter if they come, if they come to our superchargers and Tesla owners poke around more. Like we're just we have better EVs. I think that's what a lot of Tesla fans think. Obviously, if you're a fan, if you're an owner, you like that. But I think it's not 
I think the differences in range or in this software or in that are less to a lot of normal people than a lot than Elon assumes. I think a lot of people, they will like this little quirky thing about the Genesis or the, the oh. Ford Mustang Mach-E or whatever. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I think I want that EV next. That I, GD80? So. Oh, <laughs> man, that's a car, brother. But, wow, is that a yeah. car. Yeah, I think I think it's not really. I don't think people realize how much this could change the market, but it depends on if Tesla stays ahead or stays competitive. But all of a sudden, Tesla has to have owners not complaining about the noise, owners not complaining to the other EV drivers about the air conditioning vents not being. Well, more than that, if you're going to park, and I think this is this comes back to something that you and I talk about all the time: is what is your perception of quality? Is your perception perception of quality based on the features and the specs and the zero to 60 times and, and a paper read, or is your perception of quality more ethereal, more the look of the paint, the fit of the materials, the quality of the metal? If you park a Genesis GV80 next to a Tesla Model E or, or, or a Model S, let's pull it next to a Model S. It's a $100,000 car. It is going to make that Model S look like complete trash, especially if they're both the same color, because you think that there's not a real big difference in the quality of paint from one car to another. Park them next to each other. Park that park both cars next to each other on a Sunday after church. The cars are freshly washed the day before and you're going to go, wow. When, you know, did you take this Tesla into Earl Scheib and get the 9995 paint job? And they'll go, no, this is brand new. I just got it. That's it's mind blowing. And there is definitely a keyboard warrior forum type of internet guy who is a spec buyer who's going to say, well, yeah, that's great, but I've got 40 miles more range and I can get to 60 and, you know, 0.6 seconds faster than that. And there's a whole lot of other people who are going to go, yeah, but yeah, look but at that. Yeah, but I like how this one looks more. Yeah, but I like this thing on the door handle. Yeah. I think people are much more superficial with car choice than absolutely. Than, than it's not a than, rational than purchase. No, you just you like the look of something. You like yeah. the style. You like the culture. But just getting back to the one other thing you said was about, I guess, Electrify America not putting their heart into it so much. Not not not. None of them do. They're all I very think, cynical. I think this is what's really critical. Like. Elon and and the other the tons of people at Tesla, not just Elon. They looked sure. they said, What do I need to go electric? And I need yes. this. And they made it happen. And then you see Jim Farley, CEO of Ford, is on a road trip with his kids, and it and it hits him like, Yeah, we need access to a supercharger network. Like that's like my kids realize it. I if I'm not being blind and stubborn, yeah. I realize it. So yeah, we'll get access. And then the floodgates You and open. I took that very differently. I took that as, to me, I took, and I'm a Ford fan. I, I like Ford's products. I like Jim Farley. I took that as monumental blame shifting because Ford, just like Tesla, could have taken ownership of that experience. They could have built or licensed from someone else, whether it was Charge Hub, Chargeway, any of these better route planner, they could have gone in and put a real effective and clearly communicated charging app and route planner. They could have built that into their device, but they didn't do it. And that made it such a pain in the rear that Ford's own CEO couldn't do an effective road trip. But, but think, rather I than take a step back and say, we dropped the ball here. We didn't take ownership of the customer experience. We didn't develop the right software. We didn't partner with the right people. And again, my opinion, I think that would have been a natural for Chargeway, you know, especially now that Better Route Planner has been bought by Rivian. They could have made that choice and said, we're going to buy this. We're going to put this in the car. We're going to educate people on how to use it and how to plan trips. But instead he goes, no, 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 no. You know what? We didn't do anything wrong here. The problem is the charging networks. And I can uh, see that Tesla did I a mean, better job with that. So maybe we'll partner with them. I I, I, I mean, I think he's humbly acknowledging it. It's just sort of like, it's 2023. And it's like, yeah, we screwed up. We should have done this, but we didn't. Tesla did. So we need to move EVs. No reason to not use their network. So I think, it, I think it's sort of a... a I think that's a, fair. That's thought, fair. I think it's a very humble kind of like acknowledgement. Yeah, we messed up. We didn't see the future. They did. 
they get the money, they get rewarded for it. But we want to sell EVs and we're confident, this is the flip, this is the other side of it. And we're confident that our F-150 Lightning and Mustang Mach-E and future EV owners will pull up to Tesla superchargers, talk to people and sell more EVs. Yes. I think that's part of it. I think he also says, okay, well, this is where people are. This is where 60% of the EV market is in the US. And we need it to sell more EVs. And our EV owners will get more EV owners when they pull up to a supercharger and talk about how great their EVs are. And I think I think he's right. I mean, I think that's part of it. I think that's what's going to yeah, happen. No, let's, it's a perfect way of through. saying that. So let's move on. Now that we've talked about the expensive Teslas and the cheap Teslas, now we've got the cheap Fisker. So Fisker showed off the Fisker pair a couple of months ago at the Investor Day. Tesla famously teased us with a $25,000 Tesla that never materialized. Fisker did the same thing. Now, Fisker, you would think with far fewer resources, far less experience in actually manufacturing vehicles, would be less likely to deliver on that promise of a $30,000 entry-level crossover. But here they are. It's September, and they are sticking to their guns. They are adamant that this thing is coming and that it's going to start, again, not with all the features, not with all the bells and whistles, but it's going to start at thirty grand. And like, I don't know. I at, at the same time as I don't see a market for the ocean at all, I think this is kind of cool. It's got a little bit more of a funky visual vibe. It's got some neat stuff going on with a front bench seat, which I love. Totally brings me back to my childhood. And I think that this is something that's unique enough in the market that doesn't really have a direct competitor. It's a little boxier and funkier than the Model Y. I see this as taking a lot of business away from like the Jeep Renegade or the Bronco Sport that don't have electric options. And uh, I, I I see it playing in that space. Maybe the maybe the the little tiny Toyota or I'm sorry Honda HRV, but like even not that. I see it taking a lot of that business. Uh, of people who are just looking for an A to B appliance that they can fill up at Costco and transport two kids. I think it'll be great, especially if they can keep it at that price. Yeah, I 100% agree. Everything you said, Fisker designs really attractive vehicles. I think even Fisker haters acknowledge that. Uh, I've, I've met many Tesla are there fans. Fisker Fis- haters? Oh, there's there's bad blood between Henrik Fisker and Elon Musk, and there's a lot of Tesla fans who are like very negative blood around Elon. Negative on Fisker. Plus, Fisker sort of failed a few times, but uh, (laughs) but this is like his fourth. Yeah, this is his fourth startup. But I think everyone, even who's critical of him and the history, like they're like, yeah, but he designs really attractive vehicles. And again, it's a really attractive vehicle at a price point that's really compelling. It's it's July 2025 is the target date for delivery, so we're a couple years away. So I guess yeah. it's a safe, it's maybe a safe bet that that's where the market will be, but I still think it would find buyers because of the the design. I mean, it just looks cool. It's got yeah. There's like the Nissan Juke. It sort of like competes with that. I think them, the Kia Soul, uh, it, it could eat into that market. I think the oh, yeah. Jeep market is the biggest. I'm not sure how well the uh, the name will catch. I mean, it's not the most uh, the pair. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's uh, at least they didn't call just it a bit soft, but it's but at it's the same a little time, soft, yeah. Are they playing off of Apple? Like, hey, you have Apple stuff, and here's a pair. I don't. I mean, again, Fisker's a, a question mark. I mean, will they be alive? Will if he if Fisker's alive and it's been doing all right, I could see this being a blow, a, a big monumental vehicle for the for the brand. Yeah, I mean, this would be a this would be the model that I think really has potential to to make or break them. And and not make or break them like they're going to, uh, I think they will go away if the pair is not a success, but they're, they're not going to be a Ford or a Toyota or a Chevy, but I think that they could replace Mazda if Mazda doesn't get their act together or replace Mitsubishi in the United States. If Mitsubishi, you know, Mitsubishi is such a heartbreaker, man. They make such great products and then don't bring them to the U.S. What are you doing, man? Yeah, well, let's go. We, we we're like we we filled up our time with the big Tesla news, but but let's go through a few more stories before. Uh, close yeah, I mean, we can so, jam right through them. Mini has. I actually had news. like five stories. You have five you, more on top of no, my. I had five? like five that I put in there first, and then you just like put in yours and made the topic list, and mine are gone. <laughs> I didn't even see yours. Legitimately, well, I didn't see yours. No, no, it's fine. I just think it's funny. But 
Well, let's get to the yeah the next one. I'm yours are probably mini, boring. The mini anyway. family EV. <laughs> now mine. No, I'll okay. I'll just give a little background. So mine are about electric trucks, solar powered electric trucks, um, electric school buses, and stuff like that. So I think we can push that to another episode. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I, so I, I want to talk about this just because you mentioned it and you gave me an opening and I thought this was really cool. The new Mercedes electric, uh, it's a cab over design, but it's a Mercedes electric uh, class eight truck that they're using for street sweepers and yeah, uh, trash haulers. What a cool little machine this is. If you look at it, the chassis, all of that stuff, a lot of the tooling is the same as what class eight people or class eight drivers are, are used to driving right now. A lot of the suspension is the same kind of thing, but it's built almost in a hardware agnostic kind of way. So what does that mean? What that means is you could yoink out the EV bits and the battery bits and drop in a fuel cell or, you know, yoink all of that out and put in a, you know, a, a range extending generator on one half of it. And they don't really publicize that. That's not really the push for them, but they've built this in a way that they can keep churning these out for the next 15 or 20 years. And regardless of which fuel, whether it turns out to be electric fuel or hydrogen, uh, it ends up being the big winner in that heavy truck market. This truck on that same assembly line with very minor changes can still meet those needs and, and kind of come to market and they've designed this not for the fuel they've designed this around the fuel which is really really smart and kind of makes me understand why they just conquered formula one and every other form of racing they get into because these are really smart people we're talking about yeah and they they did really well with trucks and truck sales in europe to dominate mm -hmm. a big big player there uh, but yeah, it's a really cool looking truck too. I'll just, say, just put it out there. I know this is not this is not a market where it looks cool matters. I think, but um, I oh think yeah, it does. I think it's absolutely. <laughs> I think it's interesting. So we so we can squeeze these ones in as well, and because there's always going to be more news. Uh, the other big one is just Scania. Scania has got a solar powered truck uh, coming out. It's it's an interesting kind of. Uh, you know, solar powered vehicles, that's a whole, that's like an hour long discussion or debate, but it's interesting that Scania is doing, bringing one, you know, for test, yeah. you know, test, you know, kind of sales anyway. But uh, yeah, Scania is like, it's not a, this is not a Fisker. This is not a Tesla. This is Scania. This, this is like, a major, this major, is a major serious people, you know. What I like bolts. about this. So it's interesting. Yeah, what I like about this is when you say solar car, or when I say a solar RV, what I think most people think of is, well, the car will drive itself under the power of the sun. And like, no, there's not enough heat. There's not enough energy coming in that little patch of that PV patch to power that. But there is more than enough to trickle charge a battery, a 12 volt battery or, or a you know 48 volt battery pack so that you can have a stack of batteries and keep them charged for like eight hours in the day. So as you're driving this thing from point to point, it's charging the batteries so that when you stop it, it's got that sleeper cab, it's got the TV, it's got the laptop and the HVAC. You can run that vehicle. You can hotel in that vehicle. The over-the-road drivers can hotel in that vehicle without idling the engine. And that is a huge, huge, huge reduction in emissions because nothing is less efficient than the diesel at idle powering some dude's television. It's that's not the way to do no, it. That's an excellent point on why it would be really useful. Also, I mean, they have big flat, you know, tops that you can really put solar panels on and and uh, they'll collect some energy. Of course, it's not going to yeah. run the truck, but it's extra, extra. Yeah. And, It'll and run the that, refrigerator that, unit in the cab. It'll run that real all estate, of that. It's just sitting there. Uh, one issue with solar cars, whatever, is that they're parked under trees and carports and garages, and you're not actually using this, collecting much solar energy. You're not parking that, those trucks. I mean, those trucks are often going to be parked in the sunlight, yes. uh, not not blocked by trees or carports or something. And, uh, you know, another issue with solar panels on vehicles is like, you know, they get into accidents quite a bit, and then there's damage, and there's you're going to write off this whole, uh, this cost of this solar panel on your roof. Again, semi these big trucks are not supposed to get in so many accidents. They have a lot more rules and regulations to like make sure their drivers are like not speeding and 
and uh, being safe. You know, I have taken all the courses to not be idiots on the road. They're less, you know, they're in like fewer accidents, I, I, I presume. So it's an interesting case. We'll see what happens with it. Again, it could, there's been a million solar vehicle tests, you know, vehicles, whatever, and they don't go anywhere. But it's but it's Scania. And this is like, wow, Scania is doing it. So this is something. But yeah, so that's so that's that there's just some with electric school buses, just know that there's grants all over the place for these. So like if you have any connection to any school district, you know, try to push for them to get these. Uh, yeah. And we have a lot them. of friends in this space. Um, we have green power motors that are actually building the buses. We have Highland Electric. They've been guests on the show several times and they help the school districts go through and get this funding with the grant writing process. Um you know, and then there's there's other places that you'll be able to do that through ACT, GNA. Uh, these are all just companies that are out there that help to connect school districts with these grants. And, uh, you know, hit us up, accounts at cleantechnica.com. If you're uh, listening to this and or watching this and you want to talk about us to that end, uh, we'll certainly help you connect there. The, the, so, so there's we'll, so many benefits, health benefits to oh, getting yeah. your kids no on an electric bus. I don't even consider this a sponsorship thing. It's a public service to no, connect actually, these companies with the school districts. I think the first vehicles that should be electric are school buses. And it's sad that they're not the leading yeah. the charge, but they, uh, but we will push all the micro mobility, the small EV stuff to another episode, but we'll do that we'll Tuesday. To- Tuesday can be Mike. We'll do two wheel Tuesday. That can be the micro mobility day. Sounds good. But we have one more e- electric car on the list to talk about. And I know you were really excited to talk about it. I'm, I'm excited about it. Oh, the Mini Countryman? Yeah. Oh, it's a heartbreak. So Mini has brought out the Mini Countryman, and they're calling it the first family Mini. And it's, like, enormous. And I don't understand. I can't reconcile that because it's, it's. I shouldn't say it's enormous. It's about the size of a Honda CRV or a Jeep, you know, a Cherokee, like we've been talking about on the show, a Ford Escape. It's right in that size range. But I'm still convinced that a mini should be small. And I think we've gotten away from that where we've just said, look, mini is a look. Mini is a vibe. Mini is a brand. You know, to our conversation about branding from last week, you know, mini definitely has a visual style that is all its own. When you see a mini, whether it's a two door, two seat speedster or a five door, five passenger you know, mini SUV, or they're not even mini anymore, right? It's an SUV. You know that that's a mini. You know that that's from that John Cooper works sort of family of vehicles. And I think they've done a really good job with that. I don't know if this will become a mainstream thing, but, you know, 250 miles of range, room for five, take it to Costco. And it's certainly something that is different from a Model Y. I think this could steal some sales from a Model Y in the right market. Certainly Southern California, maybe Miami, where there's Model Ys everywhere and you want to stand (laughs) out a little bit. You know, a Model Y is the number one selling vehicle in like California, South Florida, a lot of markets, not electric. It's the number one selling vehicle. And um, yeah, they're everywhere, man. And it's you're going to start to see people go, you know what? I just want something different. To be, I've been wondering about this for years with California. I'm like, like how many people are going to say like, ah, it's not special. It's everybody's got one, you know. But, but it's not uh, or, or I had one and now I want something else. Like there's a lot yes. of those people. But but with many, I hundred percent agree with you. It's one. It's a brand. It's it is a brand. Like yes, people know many. People love many. Uh, that. Yatsek, who's who just got a Model Three yesterday. His wife has a Mini, and she just she wants another Mini. She loves the look. I love the look of them. Like I find, I've always been really uh, find them really appealing. I don't know what it is about them. It's this British kind of uh, cultural look to them, or something. And just they're cute. But every but everybody knows them. Like even people don't recognize cars, they recognize a Mini, right? And a lot of people love them. And yeah, they're trying to push their way into the mass market with, hey, everybody wants a, a small crossover. We can do that. I think go for it, you know, and then people are going to buy it because it's a cool looking mini, not because it's uh, they're not going to care that it's not small. You know, like I get it is the mini yeah. is in the name, but at the same time, they want the look and they want something that fits their needs and their wants. And uh, and I think the interior looked really interesting. And it's got that, of course, mini 
It's got a mini look on the interior. It's got some neat little, neat little nifty things on the inside, on the outside. It just looks like a mini, but bigger. So I don't know. I mean, I had a, I rented a mini Countryman once, and I found it funny that it was sort of big, <laughs> and it had like this big clock in the middle. And I was like, that's funny. It's like a mini, but big. And I was like, but it's still a mini, and I like it. It's cool. It's fun. It wasn't like the best vehicle in the world, that's for sure. But I think an electric Mini Countryman could definitely find a lot of buyers. I I think it's an interesting, uh, as long as it's not wicked, crazy, expensive for the range and stuff. And that's the problem with the first Mini Electric, is the range sucked and the price was really high. I was like, well, you're yeah. not buying it for that. Nobody's going on a road trip in a Mini, dude. It's like saying, oh, I wish my Miata had a sixteen. But it's got to be decent. Gas tank. Yeah. It's got to be a decent trade-off in price and range. Like it can't be too, too off the off the mark. I think you're probably right. All right, well, I think we're done for today. That's probably a good show. We're certainly well past our time commitment. Uh, definitely hit that subscribe button. We're going to start having these as audio files on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. Zachary, any uh, final thoughts here? No, that was a lot to cover. I was like. I was lot, or, we haven't even covered it. Tune in Tuesday for more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that was good.